Um, I also changed the title of my uh, presentation a little bit. It was Designing the Past Narrative and the Visual Reconstruction of Archaeology. I've changed it to Redesigning the Past and Narrative into Tweaking Narratives. It shall all be explained. Now, I am actually in my 30th year as a freelance reconstruction artist, uh, ever since I graduated from art college in Rotterdam in 1992. And I'd like to uh, believe, say, that I've done it all. From the furthest past, this was for a big exhibition on uh, Doggerland in the uh, National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden in the Netherlands. Wall-sized painting, by the way, or it was going up to, so let's say, just beyond halfway that wall. Um, for, uh, later periods, anything Roman, I've done all that. The captions are very small, aren't they, for the people sitting in the back? So, okay, I'll just shoot for them. Two medieval scenes in which you pile on the details. Mm. I'm trusted with very complicated um, uh, subjects these days. This is a, a reconstruction of a completely theoretical situation, uh, which is about the Vlading culture in the Western uh, Netherlands, in what used to be swamplands in the Neolithic, uh, let's say about 3000 to 2500 uh, BCE. And uh, what we talked about was uh, the canoes, the dugouts that they had there. They couldn't have come from trees local trees because there were simply no local trees long and straight enough. So we theorised, that was me and the paleo uh, botanists, after I'd asked the questions, that's when they started theorising, put it that way, where did these people get the trees from? So uh, they came to the conclusion that they must have gone on ex expedition to make a canoe and then uh, um, um, canoe it back. Um, so this is one of a series, I'm actually working on this project for several years. Uh, what's my next one? I forget. Um, anything from the complex then to the not so complex. This is for the Cambridge University Press, a book cover. But you, um, I hope you understand that um, by now I have so much knowledge that I can also strip away the knowledge and almost turn it into abstract images. This is a book cover, like I said, for a book about uh, textile economies in, the, in Mediterranean uh, cities. Uh, I have traveled far for my work. This was one that I did on the spot in Karanis in the Fayum in the Egyptian desert. Uh, never executed, don't think they had the money. Uh, and this is one that I did by first going to the Orkney Islands and then doing the rest at home, but it's all inspired by my visit to the Orkney Islands. But I also stay at home a lot because this panel, information panel, this is about 50 meters from my own house. <laughs> so anyway, in those 30 years, I have kind of done it all for all kinds of audiences. Um, that one on the right, by the way, the guy there sitting there, the, um, that's for Norwich uh, Castle Museum for their new exhibition, which will open, they hope, next year. Um, but that's one of the more recent things on here. Anyway, lots of that kind of stuff. But early on, I noticed that the audience would respond to how I drew how I drew a thing and not so much what. And I'm not talking style here. I'm talking about that the public, the people using and viewing these uh, illustrations, would follow me in any narrative that I set up as long as I was capable of drawing, literally drawing them in. So I started using that as my premise to tell of the archaeological past of cultures either lost forever or ancestral to ours by visually crafting narr narratives rather than just re reconstructing sites. And it's full of tricks. Now, to start off with, I want to show you this image which I only recently discovered. I saw it in an exhibition in Leiden. This is the landscape that we move in. It's a river of history of great, great length, endlessly branching off. And there is so much to dip it into, so much to draw. What do we want to tell? So I made a choice early on to try to at least weave in deeper layers into my images. But because they're only visual, I have to do so by suggestion or by visual manipulation. Have a quick look at her, or a long look. 
Now, what did you take from her? First of all, I bet you liked her face. In fact, that you were first drawn to the face. And then perhaps you thought that the style of painting had an attractive kind of naturalism, which made you believe that the cap she's wearing, it's a reconstruction of the cap she's wearing, is real. Uh, maybe you thought those Vikings, they were just like us. If so, then I manipulated you successfully. Because if you take those back points back to front, I got, to I got you to believe, first of all, that my reimagination of a period 1,000 years in the past is true. I also got, like, got you to like the face before I got you to consider the veracity of the archaeological data in it, the reconstructed archaeology. And in that way, I got even the doubters to take an interest in the work of some uh, forlorn, hidden textile scholar somewhere. What you have to remember is that it's all paint. And I can twist that knife any way I choose and help an audience to think about what might be considered otherwise boring subjects, such as this one, which is about social hierarchy. Now, it, is, it started off, again, it's a mural. It was about well, half that mural wall almost when they printed it uh, for a big exhibition on the Saxons, a uh, thousand years of the Saxons in, in two museums in Germany. Uh, Babette Ludovici, my uh, client there, now good friends, uh, she and I would uh, have long, very lovely, uh, long laughing a lot discussions about what we were actually going to draw. And in this case, the, the premise was the find of a grave of a Germanic leader of about 100 AD. So this is in Frey Germania, um, so above the Roman Lemus, um, who, had, who was buried with uh, a sword, a beautiful sword, uh, silver horse spurs and some other silver objects. Now, I could, of course, reconstructed the man with the objects. But what we talked about in one of those nice chats was how was it that he became so rich? How did he get those things? And the conclusion, I mean, based on a lot of other archaeology, of course, and the historical research, is through contacts that he, he, he um more or less broke it between the Romans and other tribes. He had good relationships, probably, or powerful relationships with uh, uh, his neighbors. So my illustration, instead of ending up as a reconstruction of a bearded young warrior, turned into one of an older political figure, 1800, 1900 years ago. This is about the power of old men. And to emphasize that he's an older man, by the way, I gave him a comb over in his uh, Schwabian knot. He's actually balding, so the last of his hair is turned into a knot. And I can use this um, visual uh, prowess, if you like, uh, to convey information that um, a general audience might uh, find slightly harder to digest. For instance, the um, now accepted fact, although I did this one in 2016, uh, that our Mesolithic, well, not our forefathers, but the people that inhabited these, uh, uh, well, let's say, northwestern Europe, were dark-skinned. So when I got this commission to make uh, an information panel for the city of Arnhem, and it was in a city park which had uh, protected Mesolithic remains underneath, I said, you know what, I'll give it back I'll, in a way, give the park back to, if you like, um, um, inner city kids. So it's about children playing in a park for long history. And the, uh, the captions tell you about the scientific research that's being done that we now believe, or at least then, uh, believe that these people were dark skinned with blue uh, or green, uh, green eyes. Um, we've progressed, of course. Now it's accepted facts. So this is... Um, uh, one that I did again for the Doggerland exhibition. These are people 15,000 years ago in what is the North Sea. Um, nobody took note of the fact that I painted these people with very dark skins. And I know exactly how dark they're supposed to be because some of the genome reports actually give you little color scales. So I know it's sort of the color of a, well, a very dark wood, like those shoes of that um, a gentleman there. This one was from what? About uh, that dark, slightly darker. Um, 
it's still in a way uh, not fully accepted. This is near the, this is was all found near or within the council area of Rotterdam, where their archaeological service still depicts Mesolithic people of olive skin because they want to be. Well, it's neither fish nor flesh, as they say in, in Dutch. They don't want to make them white. They don't want to make them black. So they make them olive skins, which I don't quite understand why they would do that. But they do. They still do that today. Now, if you wonder whether these subliminal messages in my illustrations actually reach or even affect people, here are several illustrations which I made in 1998 of uh, Tutankhamun's wardrobe. And I recently put them uh, on my uh, business Facebook page uh, because, you know, it's 100 years. I thought I'll uh, get some applause for these. I got something else because at the time, 1998, a long time ago, nearly a quarter century, uh, there was talk of Tutankhamun's grandmother, Thea, being uh, of Nubian descent. And there was talk of him perhaps being, um, in a way, half African looking as well. Uh, so in my last illustration, I tweaked him a little bit darker, and this happened. I had several hundred people wishing me dead uh, for making him too black. Um, for some reason, oh, here's a few, by the way. So pathetic fantasy, bad and lazy. You embarrassed yourself, bad, so fucking bad. And I got sent a whole load of these kinds of pictures of how it should have been historically. <laughs> Apparently, I had run into a certain group, um, Egyptians who you cannot insult deeper than by calling them Africans. Um, I got, I learned something, I learned a new word, Afrocentrism. They were all opposing Afrocentrism, the idea that uh, there was any black ancestry uh, uh, possibly in them. Um, they seem to take our way of reimagining the past very seriously, and they wanted it done to their vision, scientifically accurate, as they told me, and they abhorred, apparently, the addition of every narrat any narrative. But it took a sledgehammer like this, because I know it was tweaked a little bit, you know, darker. Uh, it took a sledgehammer to make them realize that there is always a narrative. Now. In 2011, English heritage at the time, now Historic England, had a visualization in archaeology conference at the University of Southampton. And I first presented my theory of the free schools. I'll go through it very quickly. Um, the free schools are the three different ways people set out to make uh, archaeological reconstruction drawings. It starts with, in England, and I'll take the uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, world as, the, as, the, as my example here, uh, in England, it starts with Alan Sorrell, who after the Second World War, not early, uh, early 1950s, I believe, um, set out to make a whole lot of reconstructions of English sites and monuments in which um, it is more like an impression. The weather plays a lot of, uh, 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 plays a great role. He called his, the figures in his illustrations, he called them actors as well. If you noticed, uh, Judith Dorby, whom I've also included in that category, she mentioned weather at the start of her talk. Now, that's not very scientific. She said, I can help you convey the effects of weather. So she goes into that group. Because of the popularity of Alan Sorrell's work, which was done for a ministry, um, uh, we get early 60s, we get this whole um, flood of magazines, popular scientific magazines and books, in which a lot of illustrators who later, later worked in archaeology, like Ron Embleton and Angus McBride, started their uh, career, but they had very tight deadlines. So they, they didn't use first, they weren't talking to archaeologists anymore. They were not using first-hand sources. They were using second-hand sources. So you'll get a bit iffy use of details and clothing all thrown together. And they uh, depend on bright colors for impact and exciting compositions. Now, thinking this all a little too uh, not serious enough, Peter Connolly in 1975 published The Roman Army, in which he took... He also his own practical research into objects and buildings and uh, reconstructed them in these much more serious manners. Now, his influence is still alive today. All these people making 3D reconstructions work from the premise that you can build something 
when I originally published this theory, which is also in Judith Dorby's book, by the way, it's mentioned in the foreword, I called the builders the technicians, but it's not the right word. Builders is where they kind of build, uh, build it up. They tend to present, in my opinion, the past as a perfect version of itself. So if I go back to the narrators, I include myself as a narrator, uh, nothing is perfect, nothing stands still, and all days have their quiet, uninteresting moments, which one cannot label Roman or prehistoric. They're just dull. This is my illustration for Archaeology, for Archaeology the American magazine uh, spread. Mike Pitts wrote the article. It was all based on the newest of the newest that they knew about Stonehenge, who I loved, was the caption that the Americans put to it, uh, put underneath it. And it was something about uh, a typically typical day in England, <laughs> <laughs> a typical summer rain, which is exactly what I hoped they would get across, the idea that it is just a day with families and people working. The, the building is the boring bit. Now, so I see, calling myself a narrator, I see ahead of me the freedom of subjects or impressions I am able to explore um, and uh, whatever I want in principle. But my clients, as well, your clients as well, my clients, have a rather set idea of what a reconstruction of the past is, or at least what it is supposed to achieve. So if I just throw, to, up to, throw at you these images, I'll go from them quickly because they're actually stills from a film. They fascinated ever since I was a teen. It's the first film ever shot, 1895. You see material culture specific to the period. You see period specific clothing. You can date it to the clothing. And there is action going on that is directly related to the material culture. It, it meets all the criteria that we use for archaeological reconstruction drawings. Same with these. They are rather pleasant to look at reconstructions of the past. They actually weren't made as long ago as you think. They're not even reconstructions. They're actually uh, copied in paint postcards. The research has been done in the archives. What were the original colors or by memory? But they're actually just repainted photographs and colored. These are very nice, pleasant, kind views of the past, but what if we bring other knowledge of the past that we have into focus? A toilet in Auschwitz. Well researched. Not a pleasant image anymore. So he upgraded the subjects, the artist. I'm a great fan of this artist, it's a Dutchman. This is the execution of several men in the, during the war in Bosnia. Reconstructed from eyewitness uh, accounts, he then took uh, uh, photographs at the place where it happened, had people model them, it's all like I would work, and then put them back together to reconstruct a moment that wasn't seen by others. Even closer, he takes the death by torture of one man and a date, and he reconstructs it in the right place, perhaps even the right perpetrators. You might want to look away at the next one, because then he started studying eyewitness accounts of things, the dehumanization of people that they felt in, uh, uh, people that were inmates of Auschwitz. This is the rape of two inmates raping a third. And this is him explaining you why. If painful histories do not hurt people who have not been a direct witness, then society is evolving towards a false historical sense and morality. Chapter three, love, sex, family, and dull times. So our clients in the art world of archeology span don't exactly allow us to touch on the full range of subjects real life offers. Everything between love and sex, from waking up to going to sleep, from how we deal with etiquette towards one or friendly chatter with another, all those moments in which nothing happens, whereas archeological finds show us lots of these things. I didn't know this one until recently, but it's absolutely beautiful. 
it's what you read in between the lines here that I want you to take care, uh, take note of. It's a woman suckling a child at the same time she's being lovingly, uh, um, I don't know, defleeced or, or having her hair combed by a second woman. We get all sorts of human experiences in, the, in archaeology. I, there's two of them I don't think I have to explain, but the one on the right, those are uh, bound and executed prisoners uh, found on Sicily, about 400 uh, BCE. Nor do I think I have to explain you the physical reality of what went on here. Uh, I once read a caption to say that whoever shot this man was probably hiding in a tree because he shot him from top to bottom. Neolithic uh, Denmark. And up to now, these kinds of subjects have been worked rather clean by myself. Oh, something went wrong with the caption. Um, I'll tell you what it says then. So uh, on the left is, uh, she was in the news a few years, uh, about two years ago. Um, they found, uh, it was a, an Iron Age town, 300 BCE, of the Baronis uh, tribe in northern Spain. They found um, the skeleton of a teenage girl and two meters further along, her hacked off arm. But because I was compiling material for a book on prehistoric costume, I was interested in the arm because all her bangles were still on it. She was wearing like, was it five co uh, copper bangles on one arm? So my reconstruction, that's why it is clean, is of what the girl was wearing with what I, I don't know she was wearing, left out, blanked out white. But uh, the story behind it, of course, is absolutely horrific, just as it is with the um, uh, Cloney Van, Cloney Cavan, sorry, uh, Chieftain, the uh, bo famous bog body from um, uh, Ireland, who was, the theory is that he was uh, tortured to death, that he was probably a king, um, and then buried on the boundary between two tribes. Um, so it's just a man who fell from power, a young man, who was so small that he put pine resin in his hair to lift it up. This is a very serious, because I talked to the expert about the reconstruction of what this Iron Age um, uh, thing would have looked like. But again, my illustration is a rather clean um, depiction of what happened next. Mine is about the costume. In fact, I actually believe there's a lot of um, value in restraint. This is uh, my reconstruction of the leather armlet of another of those uh, kingly uh, bog bodies from Ireland. Um, I didn't need to tell you about how this man died. What I want need to tell you about is that the leather of his little bracelet, which was very tight and left a big imprint on the, on the um, bog body remains, um, would have originally been white. That's all this illustration tells you. There are plenty of other aspects of life still underrepresented in our visualizations of the father's past. Because if you recall the stream of time image I just showed you, I say that anywhere you dip your toes, things will look and work differently. In every century, place, each place, material culture will have its own character. And yet, in our archaeological reconstruction drawings, if I were to show you a photograph of a house in Germany now, in a village in Germany, you'd probably recognize it as German. But why can I never, in archaeological reconstruction art, discern between a Romano-British building and an Italian building? There's a lot to explore in the visual arts. Objects simply, yeah, yeah I will, very quickly. Uh, objects simply have a character that belongs to their time. These are my very, very precise reconstructions of finds done in a castle in which I've, I've looked at the details of the objects simply to tell you the story what the object was used for. Um, other aspects often forgotten are phenomenological impressions such as singular viewpoints, personal experience, or simply the sensation of scale. Oh, sorry, this is another one in the category uh, what something in a certain time looked like other than in another time. This is about scale. It's only about scale. I'd been to the replica cave, and when I got the commission to do Lascaux Cave, I forget all the fancy bits of people playing, playing drums and, you know, hunter gatherers dancing. It's about scale. That was the impressive thing. So for my last slide, let's return to the more fiscal subjects. War. I picked this one up the other week. Um, the archaeology of Caesar's Gallic War. 
And this is what we're expected to show. What war look, what costumes look like, what weapons look like. Whereas if you read Caesar's uh, um, Gallo Gallic War, I'll just say it in English, I found this um, description of um, tribes, people of the Bellavaci, which is a Belgian tribe, who when Caesar was approaching their, um, uh, their uh, camp, their uh, uh, town, first the old men came out and they stretched out their arms, save us. And then when they got to the walls, all the women and boys did the same. They stretched their arms, according to Caesar, after their custom, and they begged peace from the Romans. They begged for their lives. So this is my reconstruction. Careful and deliberate. If you notice, there's actually some archaeology in it. There, the little uh, bracelet. With attention to age-appropriate detail of something you don't see very often. An Iron Age fear for family. A fear of pain. A fear of loss. Emotion, emotions which go far beyond the broken pots and rusted metal we dig from the ground now and through which our imagination can truly connect to our prehistory. Thank you.